Mr. Belcher here again with another screencast. Today what we're going to be talking about is Jacksonian democracy. Really what this is is the second part of the growth of a young nation. The first part again was the uh, Jeffersonian era that we talked about uh, in the last screencast. So let's get to this. Your learning outcome for today is describe the factors that elevated Andrew Jackson to becoming the president and was Jacksonian democracy really a democracy? Uh, think about considering uh, the spoil system, the Trail of Tears, and the Bank War uh, when you're thinking about answering that question. So Andrew Jackson himself, he was nicknamed Old Hickory because he was supposedly as strong as Old Hickory would. Uh, he was uh, tough and aggressive in his nature as a, as a person. He grew up very poor, and he kind of was a self-made man. So he's really going to start favoring the common person. And really, like we talked about in class, he's going to be made famous by his victory over the British at the Battle of New Orleans. And again, strangely enough, that Battle of New Orleans was after the War of 1812 was over with. That Treaty of Ghent was signed on uh, Christmas Eve 1814. And really, he likes to play himself up as a man of the people. And at the end of Jackson's presidency, uh, people can really say that he is the closest thing that we've ever had to a monarch in our country. He really kind of asserts himself and, and asserts the power of the presidency like no one else has done before him and no one else after him until we get to Abraham Lincoln. And one of the first things that he kind of introduces is this spoil system. And what he's going to do is start to propose jobs for those that uh, support him, either friends or other political allies. So what he's going to do is is turn over those government jobs to those that have supported him in his campaign. And really what this does is it leads to a lot of people in government that are highly unqualified for their positions. Uh, and it comes down to Jackson replacing approximately 10% of the government with these spoil appointees. And we really, this system is going to be in place uh, for a long, long time. We don't have uh, this reformation of the merit system for, for until the 1900s. This is a highly corrupt system because the people really that are being appointed to these positions don't have to answer to anybody but the person who appointed them. So uh, they're not qualified and they're just not a representation of the people itself. The next big thing in President Jackson's tenure and in office is the Indian Removal Act. And to set this whole thing up, the state of Georgia finds out that the Cherokees on this land have really fertile soil and also gold. Not just the Cherokee, but a lot of other Native American tribes are going to be forced to relocate off of their, their land. Uh, a lot of these people, a lot of these Native Americans are going to do this willfully and others are not. Cherokee are going to fight this and fight as hard as they can. Uh, ultimately, it's going to go all the way to the Supreme Court in Worcester versus Georgia. And the Supreme Court is actually going to find in favor of the Cherokee. You would think at this point that the issue would be dead, but that's not the case. Uh, the Supreme Court is going to rule that Georgia couldn't regulate Cherokee land, the state itself, and that uh, it could only be regulated between the federal government and the Native American tribes. It had been decided earlier that the, the federal government and the Native Americans are only ones that could make these types of treaties. Jackson, however, is going to support the state of Georgia and refuses to follow the decision of the Supreme Court. President Jackson is going to basically make a statement and say, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Build a fire under them. When it gets hot enough, they'll go. And what he's doing is basically telling John Marshall, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, that, you know what, I'm the executive, I am in charge of the entire military force, and I will use them at my discretion. And basically telling John Marshall, well, you've made this decision, let's see you try to actually enforce the law. And what he's going to do right at this point is extend the power of the executive branch of government over the Supreme Court. And this, the last part here is build a fire under them, and when it gets hot enough, they'll go. He's referring to the Native Americans at this point. So what he's saying is make it so hard for them to uh, live in that area that eventually they'll simply leave. Throughout the Indian Removal Act, Jackson is going to authorize the military to use force and to round up these Native American uh, tribes into these specific camps. And at certain points, they're going to send these tribes on this approximately 800-mile long journey. Uh, for some, it's longer. For others, it's a little bit shorter. Like the Seminole tribe in, in Florida, it's going to be a little bit longer of a journey for them. The problem is, though, 
is they're going to be sent uh, sending these Native Americans on this trail with very little supplies. Uh, there's really no sh a lot of them don't have any shoes, uh, very small amounts of food, and they're not equipped for this type of walk. And they're walking this 800 miles. Uh, approximately one quarter of these Cherokee are going to die on this trail, and hence the name Trail of Tears. That quarter is going to amount out to about 60,000. Uh, it gets so bad that a lot of these Cherokee are going to die of diseases, and as these uh, soldiers are, are kind of marching them into the what is modern-day Oklahoma, the ones that are sick are not going to be allowed to enter any towns or anything for a chance of infecting other people. So they're actually going to have to go around these cities, and it's going to take a lot longer. And you can see in this, this map here where the tribes are going to be kind of forcibly relocated from. Uh, the Seminole tribe there in central Florida, 1832, 1833, are going to go across the top of the Gulf of Mexico up through Louisiana. And ultimately, the central part of the United States has at this point been deemed kind of this very large reservation for Native Americans for all different tribes. We have Cherokee, Choctaw Creek, Chickasaw, all sorts of them in there. Uh, you can kind of see right here in the in the Georgia area, the, the light area, that's really where there's going to be that major, major kind of conflict over the territory. Very fertile land, and again, uh, the discovery of gold there. So the United States is going to try and push them forcibly out. Moving forward into the nullification crisis, uh, Andrew Jackson, is, his presidency is just riddled with kind of conflict after conflict after conflict. The so-called tariff of abominations, according to John C. Calhoun in South Carolina, is hurting the South as a whole. And what the tariff of abominations is, is a high tariff that has been put on manufactured goods, specifically from Britain. And what is going to happen from this is the British are, if they have a high import tariff, they're going to start importing less. And when they start importing less, they're going to start buying less. So that high import tariff is going to lead to the, uh, to the British buying less southern cotton. Therefore, the southerners are going to have to buy more expensive items from the north that are manufactured. So what the what John C. Calhoun is going to say is that it's a it's this abomination that we're having to forcibly support the North, and the North is becoming rich off of the Southerners. And what John C. Calhoun is going to kind of make a case for is the states itself should be able to declare a law unconstitutional. He believes that each state, each of those original 13 colonies, was found as an independent state and should be able to declare any sort of laws null and void. So what this is really going to bring about a question is over states' rights. Should a state be allowed to declare certain laws that they don't feel are beneficial to them, unconstitutional, and just simply ignore them? Or is it is a federal law a federal law and there's just no other argument about it? So 1832, strangely enough, Congress is going to kind of stick it to John C. Calhoun and raise tariffs again. South Carolina is going to deem the 1832 tariff null and void and not enforce it. And really what the, what's going to come out of this tariff of 1832 is the threat, uh, the threat of secession, meaning that they want, they're threatening to leave the Union. They're going to leave those 13 colonies. And this is going to be a trend that South Carolina is going to set. They're the number one state that is ready to kind of one foot out the door and ready to leave at the drop of a hat. President Jackson, despite the fact that he's a Southerner, is really kind of upset by this act of South, by South Carolina. What Jackson is going to do is push through the force bill, which is going to allow Congress to use force to collect all those duties from, the, uh, from that tariff that South Carolina says they're not going to pay. Uh, we're really at this point thinking that it is going to come to this mini civil war with the uh, federal troops going down to South Carolina to forcibly collect the taxes. Luckily, Henry Clay steps in. Uh, he's kind of known as the great compromiser uh, throughout this whole time period, even through the 1850s. The next uh, kind of 20, this 20 year period is, is kind of his time to shine. What he is going to propose is that uh, he's going to institute or kind of what he's going to propose is a tariff that would lower customs duties over a 10 year span. So each side is still going to get a little bit of what they want. So this, uh, this kind of give and take a little bit from each side. So luckily, South Carolina is going to agree to this, and we are going to kind of avoid this little bit of a civil war that could, pot could potentially have happened. Moving straight from that, another conflict, 
is Jackson and this bank war. Uh, remember, Jackson being this common man, this favoring the, the everyday person, growing up poor, he believes that the second bank of the United States is just simply an agent of the wealthy, and it's only there to serve those rich people. So what Jackson is going to do in his second term is withdraw all of the government money from this bank. And what this is going to do when you withdraw the government's money is it makes that second U.S. bank just simply another bank, like any other bank that's around around town. He's also at this point, after the Indian Removal Act, the Trail of Tears, kind of going against John Marshall and telling him, you know what, you are telling me no, but try to stop me. Going through the nullification crisis and now the bank war, a lot of people are going to start to criticize Jackson and accuse Jackson of being more like a king than like a president. Again, he's elevated that role of the presidency that much higher over the other two branches of government. So going back to our learning outcome, through this, be able to describe the factors that, le that elevated Andrew Jackson to become president. Think about the War of 1812 and his Battle of New Orleans and his victory there over the British. And was this era of Jacksonian democracy really a democracy? If he can, again, keep in mind the spoil system, the Trail of Tears, and that bank war. And we'll leave you with this. Check out this political cartoon here of King Andrew I. It's depicting Andrew Jackson as a king. Uh, check out what he's got holding in his hand there. There's a scepter and also in his other hand the power of the veto. And then also look at what he's standing on. It's the Constitution of the United States. And keep in mind here why he's kind of standing on the Constitution here is because he has exerted so much power as president that he is almost acting like a monarch would have acted. So you see at the top here, born to command, uh, a veto memory, and had I been consulted on the side. Again, we are not going to see this type of power from the, pres the office of the president until about a th another 30-year time period when Abraham Lincoln kind of leads us into the Civil War. So that's all I got for today. Try to keep it short for you guys. If you have any questions, email me. Let me know in class. Stop by 3104, and I'll be happy to help. So I will uh, see you next time. Thanks for watching.